hello, uh, my name is Donna Sherrod. I'm a Master Gardener uh, volunteer with Cornell Cooperative Extension in Westchester. And uh, thank you to the Austin Organic Community Garden for inviting me here. Um, so hopefully I can give you some hints on um, improving your harvest, although I saw a lot of vegetables out there, so <laughs> seem to be doing a really, really good job. Um, I figured I would talk a little bit about soil, pH, which is related to soil, uh, insects harvest, and then preserving the harvest. So we're just going to go a general overview, and then I would take questions. Because um, I know I have some ringers in here, good gardeners. <laughs> I see them. I see them. They're going to put me to the test. So I might not be teaching you too much, but hopefully a thing or two. Um, but first, since I'm um, so privileged to have this filmed and uh, on Go TV, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about Cooperative Extension. Um, maybe some of you know about it, um, and I'll review. Uh, in uh, 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed the Land Act, uh, a land grant act, uh, so that universities would be built in every state of the country of the U.S. And um, up until that point. There was a lot, uh, the universities were, um, you know, you'd study to be a doctor or a lawyer or, or something like that. Uh, but they really wanted to have studies in agriculture and um, practical arts, as they call it, or the home, home arts, um, so people would know how to grow food and get the science behind it. Uh, so in New York State, uh, Cornell University is the land grant university um, for us. Um, not to be confused with the very, very well endowed private Cornell University. It is the public university, which is right next door, um, and that is funded by the state um, and the federal um, as a land grant. And then in 1915, uh, Woodrow Wilson signed uh, the Smith Lever Act, which made uh, established uh, cooperative extension so that the, all the science from the universities could come into our communities. So there was a cooperative extension in every county in the, in the state, in the country. Um, and then Master Gardeners came like, really recently, in the 1980s, <laughs> to try to bring it even closer. So instead of having just to go to the county office, um, we could come out into the community. So we're trained. We have to go through 200 hours of training. And then we have to, every year, um, do volu volunteer work um, to meet our um, our requirements and we have to continu do continuing ed so we can stay on top of the uh, scientific information that's there. So that said, I definitely don't know everything, but I feel really confident because any questions that you give me that I can't answer, all those scientists from all those land grant universities are standing behind me and um, you can put a call in. I have uh, brochures here. This is the, about the Elmsford office. Um, so this is your Westchester County Cooperative Extension and you can call them uh, and they would um, help you with any of your, not just vegetable gardening, but uh, anything with lawns or trees, um, and they would try to get the information for you. Um, also, um, Cornell it, up in Ithaca has a great website, which is www.gardening.cornell.edu, uh, and that has also information. Um, they even have it by vegetable, so you can look up tomato, you can look up the insects, you can look up lawns, or um, how to preserve a harvest, so they have a lot of information there. And then I brought you, um, this is the brand new uh, calendar for planting vegetables. So um, you're welcome to take these. Um, and this is available, I believe, on their website. If not, you can call up the office and they would get it for you. But it tells you um, when the best time is and what, if it should be the seeds or the transplants. And um, what's interesting is it also tells you when you can replant. So you can do um, succession succession plantings, which is really great if you want to, uh, you know, maximize your harvesting. You want to keep planting things. Uh, so uh, I thought I would talk a little bit about soil. And the, the interesting thing about soil is people just usually think about it as dirt, but soil is actually 45% mineral, which is um, from the ice age, the rocks <laughs> broke down into little tiny little bits, and then we get the soil. Um, and you see that if you're in a, a, like a very rocky mountain area, there's like little crevices. Over time, dirt accumulates and then things grow in it. And that's um, similar to how we got soil. But it's only 45%. 25% is water and 25% is air. And the other 5% is the organic matter. And that's like when the leaves fall off the trees and they decompose and that incorporates into the soil. Um, 
in a community garden, you can add a lot more of that organic matter or compost, is what we call it here. Um, the important thing about this is, is that quite often people overwater. They water because it's Tuesday or whatever, um, and not the soil might not need the water. If you're <coughs> watering when the soil is already wet, you're flushing out the air, and that's really bad for the roots, unless, of course, you're a wetland plant, which doesn't need all that air. But for a community garden or, um, or somebody's lawn, if you water too much, you're going to rot the roots, and you're going to have a lot of um, problems. Your plants are going to susceptible. They're going to be <coughs> struggling because they're not in the top health, so they're going to be more susceptible to disease and insects. So it's, um, this is always really important to know. And the, and the other thing is, is that the organisms in the soil are what create the channels for the air and the water. So organic practices, which is what they do here at the garden, is really great because you don't want to um, destroy any of those insects because those are the ones that are getting those channels that are allowing the air and the water to get to your plant. Um, and then a big part of um, the issue of soil is <coughs> pH. And, um, we have a high pH here, but the pH is, means it's a measurement of hydrogen ion, the concentration in the soil. So a very low pH would be great for blueberries, like over here. Um, and then um, a high pH would be good for lilacs, but to a point. There's a point where the, the pH is too high or too low. So you want to get the optimal amount of, of optimal pH for your soil to grow the vegetables. Now I have a chart here, and it shows what the minerals are available at the different pHs. So right here between six, five, and seven, you get the maximum amount, the overlap, where the maximum amount of the nutrients are available to the plants is in that between six, five, and seven, um, and that is what the ideal for vegetable gardens is around 6.5 for that reason. So when you have a, a very high pH or a very low pH, <coughs> your vegetables can suffer. And when the vegetables are su the vegetable plants are suffering, they're going to be susceptible because um, they're struggling. So they're going to be trying to keep themselves alive instead of fighting off the insects and disease. So they're like sitting ducks. Um, so a lot of times people add fertilizer and um, obviously we want to use organic fertilizers um, for many reasons. The biology in the soil is one. Um, and the other thing is that it's, um, it's, it's too fast that they're uptaking these very high uh, uh, fertilizers. So the, every fertilizer you buy has three numbers on it. This one says two, three, one. If you, the, the trick to knowing, uh, besides it saying the word organic, if you go and get um, one of those big evil companies that has, um, you know, their color blue, <laughs> it's probably going to be very high numbers because they're giving a big dose of all that fertilizer. So the number, the first number is nitrogen, the second number is phosphorus, and the third number is potassium. So the nitrogen um, helps with the leaves and um, the, the stems growing. Uh, the Phosphorus is good for flowers and seeds, and the potassium is, gives vigor to the plant. So you want all of those. Now, what I would do is I would use this early in the season, and I would use this one later in the season because it's just the potassium. Because you don't need to keep growing fast the plants. What happens is when they, the plant cells develop, if they're growing too fast, they can't protect their outer, the outer part of the cell, and that makes them susceptible. And sometimes when people um, fertilize house plants, and you give it a healthy dose of, I don't know if that's the right word, you give it a big dose of fertilizer, the house plants get ta attacked by aphids. And it's because the plant has grown so fast it can't defend itself. So it's good to not over fertilize, um, and I would, I would use it sparingly. I tend to use half of what they recommend. And um, because I think that it's just better for the plant to just gently absorb all of that. Uh, Cooperative Extension sells these pH tests, which you can use for your home. Um, and you can call them up and they'll, they'll go over how you can do it. I would also recommend if you're having issues with plants, be it at home or here, that you call Cooperative Extension and find out about doing a, a more extensive soil test. Um, and it's around 10 
10 to 20 dollars to do that and you um, not only to get this, the results of the soil test which um, I had done when we first started the community garden I did the soil test in March of 2010 um, you also get access to the extension agent who can help you interpret this because you look at it and it's a bunch of numbers um, but uh, some of it's obvious um, but they would help you um, know what it is and then what you can do to remedy whatever is missing on that. Um, so I thought I would also um, tell you of some of the tools that I have. Yes. Speaking then that we don't need to do that for here but we would do it at our homes? If you're having problems with your plants I would do it here too. Okay. Yeah. And that's because the thing is when we started we all started the same. Right. So in 2010 when the garden started um, we had all the same compost, all the same soil, and we had 6.9 pH, which is pretty good. It's a tiny bit high, but pretty good. Now it's very much higher. So um, it depends on what everyone is doing in their plots, what you're putting in. If you're putting in a, you know, a purchased uh, compost, there's probably a pH to that. The pH of water, because the water comes through pipes, is, um, has to be at a level. As we know from Flint, Michigan, you, know, you really want your water people doing what, they've got, what they're supposed to do, and our town is doing what they're supposed to do, and that is keeping the pH higher so that the, the pipes stay good, um, but so then you're adding a higher pH when you're watering. So it's things to consider. Um, so if you're having issues, um, you know, just the plant vigor is not good and you think you're doing everything right, get a soil test. It's, I think it's really worth it and then they'll tell you, um, try to help you work with that. Yeah, we had communicated about the water. That was a surprise to me. Water. It was a surprise to me too, and it was actually when I called it because I wanted to find out what the pH of all the products were. And that this company, who they were very, very nice on the phone, they told me their their pH is three five, and they said, "But what's the water you're mixing it with?" Which I never would have right. thought of. So, so it's um, but it's so it's good to know. And, and I think your comment about overwatering, I, I think I'm guilty of overwatering. Yeah. I really do. I think I have to water less. So I have two things. One is that um, I think it would be really worth the garden. We had it at one point, but I think it broke. But it would be really worth getting a very inexpensive water gauge um, so that you know. Because last week, we had the rain we just had was a half an inch. The rain we had before that was three inches. Mm -hmm. So rule of thumb, um, you need one inch of water a week at home. Mm -hmm and in the garden. Mm -hmm. So you're, when people put irrigation on automatically on Tuesday or whatever day it is that they put it on without being aware of how much it rained, they're probably overwatering and they're gonna, it's gonna cause you know, all kinds of fungus and disease and things. And this would cause rotting in, um, when you have three inches of rain and then you come and water. So once a week you should, take a, you should look at what's in the water gauge and then communicate it to everybody and then dump it out Yes, dumping week. it out is the good. It's yeah. really good. <laughs> 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 we have a water gauge. It's just that we just keep <laughs> adding to it. We don't have any. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so one inch a week is all well, that's really that's all that's really needed. Okay, so um, I have another really great tool. You don't even. You all came with it, and it's this. Okay. So what I do is when I come to my garden, I just stick my finger in. That soil's pretty wet because it's sticking your finger. Yes. I, well, you know it. It's wet. Yeah. So um, if it's really dry, you can't get your finger in at all. But you can, that, this should not be watered. I mean, it's, these are perennial native flowers. They shouldn't be watered ever anyway because they're native and they're growing out there without water. They don't need water here. So, um, but the vegetables are not, um, for the most part, I would, get, I would pretty much assume they're not native plants that we're, that we're growing here. And we're trying to cultivate them and we're trying to get them to grow all this, you know, food for us so we're you know we have to water and, and baby it you know but um, you don't want to overwater so that's the, the one tool you bring with you and the other tool you need to get um, the rain gauge oh, we can have one we just have to start systematically yeah. Yeah. looking at it yeah yeah because yeah. yeah, that that would be really good so if you could post the numbers near the faucet people will know whether they should be turning it on or not in other words well you, you guys can talk about that yeah. Yeah. offline yeah. Yeah. right yeah. Yeah. okay yeah. <laughs> So the other really good tool is to have um, an insect guide. Now I've had this for um, more years than I care to um, reveal, <laughs> but um, uh, there's another one that is a newer one that I also like. This is a great one. This is Max Fields Guide, and this is the good garden bugs of the Northeast. And the other side is the bad <laughs> garden bugs of the Northeast. Uh, but it also tells you down here, which is really great, um, this is the habitat 
um, where the bad bugs, they're, they're, where they hang out, like if they're gonna um, be on cucumbers or melons, and it tells you down here. So, of course, this is just a fraction of the insects that exist in our world. I think we have over or around 200 native bees, varieties of native bees in the Northeast. So, you know, this is never going to uh, get it. But these are the big ones. These are the ones that you would normally see. The only downside to this is it doesn't show you the egg stage, which is, um, which is really good to know. But you can, if you're seeing one of these bugs, you should look them up on the Cornell website and see about all the life cycle because the insects usually you know, have more than one stage. So there's usually eggs and, you know, or different stages. So you need to know because you don't want to get rid of ladybug eggs but you want to get rid of the Mexican bean beetle eggs, which look really similar. So you need to learn what they look like. And they'll be on different, like the, on the beans, it's going to be the Mexican bean beetle eggs, you know. And the, but the ladybug might be on something else, basil or something. So you need to um, look that up, and that's a good way to defend. But I would get something and bring it to the garden with you so that you can um, control the insects when you see them. And there's, um, there's several different uh, books, so you're welcome to look at these later. But it's good just to keep it in your toolkit um, and know what to do. The other thing that I do, oh, I have it here as a weight, is I bring um, a magnifying glass. So, because some of the things are really small. If you have a plant that's being attacked, it's got holes in it, um, it looks like it's being eaten, look at it and find out who's doing that. You know, and um, this is a really good tool to do, or you can get one that has a cover on it, which keeps it nicer. Um, but that's, and then there's some really, it's a fascinating, coming to the garden is about growing food, community garden is about growing food, but it's about other things too. And one is about just coming and getting away from everything and just getting in touch with nature. So part of that is when you're really looking so closely at things, it's quite amazing. Um, when I was here one time, uh, saw somebody else pointed it out to me on a basil leaf was these little tiny strands and with a little tiny dot, it looked almost like the, a very miniature Christmas ornament. I mean, really, really small. And that's a lace bug, the green lace bug, which is a beneficial insect. And it was just hanging on somebody's basil leaf. So um, you'd want to not harvest that with basil leaf. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's important to know about the, uh, about the insects on the plants. And then, um, then oh, oh, the other thing I wanted to tell you about with the with the calendar here about when to plant. The other thing to know is the soil temperature. So this is past this point, but when you're starting next year, uh, peas, I believe it has to be between 40 and 50 degrees, the soil temperature. So you would stick this into the ground and you would get a reading. Um, soil temperature is very different than air temperature. And um, when you plant the peas at 40 degrees, if you had waited to 50 degrees, they'll probably do better because um, it's a little warmer and they won't rot. And but if you do it below 40 degrees, they'll probably rot the seeds. Is that a meat thermometer? No, this is a it's soil. A, it's a soil it's thermometer? Yeah, it's a soil. soil. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a soil. So you would just stick it in the ground. And um, well, right now it's probably similar to the air temperature. But, um, if it changes. But then that's really important for tomatoes because tomatoes want to be in South America. They were, they had no intention of coming up here. <laughs> and we forced them to come up can't here. Get home. Yeah. And, and then people put them out. The, the Mother's Day sales at the beginning of May. Everyone sells yeah. tomatoes and then people plant them. And it's way too early. So it's uh, my rule of thumb is Memorial Day or after based on the soil temperature. So it's um, this is a really inexpensive um, tool to get to. Uh, you know, I've had it for several years, so I don't know, but I know that I, I bought it really kind of quickly, so I didn't have to think, so it had to be cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so we should have one. We, we yeah, this buy would be great for the, yeah. see, the soil temperature seems to be the same as the air temperature, cause, but that yeah, would make sense, you know, it's just like, uh, like the, um, you know, ocean waters, like they warm up and get to a constant at a point. Um, but say if it was 100 degrees today, this temperature would not, the soil temperature would not change fluctuate that much but it's very important for um, several of the plants and and that you can also look up to like what the soil temperature has to be for the different the, plants. Um, the planting guide you showed earlier it does not give the, soil temperature no, 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 yeah. question. has that been adjusted based on climate change this is the they just adjusted it this mm -hmm. is brand new so not only is it now in color it also they have um, adjusted it for that so um, as good as they can guess 
Uh, but you know, you have to know that this is, is giving you a calendar, and plants and insects don't don't recognize man-made calendars. What they recognize is called growing degree days. What that's what we've developed to try to speak their language. Um, Cornell uh, Cooperative Extension in Westchester takes readings at the Westchester Airport. Uh, what it is is as soon as the temperature reaches reach 50, every degree over is like a point. So um, the insects, when uh, people that have farms, really rely on growing degree, degree days because they know when what insect is going to emerge. Mm -hmm. And then they can use their pesticide or their mm, organic methods. They don't have to guess when the Japanese beetle is coming. It's coming at a specific day based not on the calendar, but based on growing degree days. So it's a really important number. And, um, now, a lot of seed packets have the temperature. Do, have they also, do you think, been adjusted to increase? If it's saying more? the temperature, then it's just the temperature. Like the, the, but oh, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the temperature okay. just might right. happen earlier. Right. So, okay. um, but so mainly, I, th I think what it is, is they're having these big swings. So you're having very extreme rain. Not having those gentle rainstorms as much, you're having big extreme, and so it's it's you know it's kind of hard to know. So, but if you go with the growing degree days, that's what the insects and the plants recognize. So, um, then breezing right through here, the next thing is harvesting, and that's I found um, working with a lot of people that seems to be the hardest thing to do. Um, so, I would really become um, diligent, and when you see something ripe pick it and use it. That's the whole reason that you've gone through all this trouble and um, and it's and that's what we're doing this for. And when you're doing that, when you're harvesting your food, you're really making a difference um, because the tomato that comes from California or the garlic that comes, 90% of the garlic sold in this country comes from China, which is bizarre because it's the easiest thing to grow. So think about the footprint. In the New York Times this Sunday was an article about how bananas, the, how the bananas come to the city. And it's um, on these huge container ships. Uh, you know, so when you're, when you're growing your stuff here, you are, you're, you're making a difference. You know, you're getting healthy food, but you're also lessening your carbon footprint. And, um, and I think that's real. And then it's also a matter of food security, which is um, Cooperative Extension uh, is a partner with the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And that was a, pro a program, a department that started after 9-11 just to address food security. And um, it's a big issue. You know, we worry about our, our uh, reservoirs and our airports. We need to really be concerned with food. And the more food we grow locally, um, it's, it's better for everyone. Um, and then uh, at a community garden, you get to meet all these great people and, and make friends like I have. <laughs> so, um, and then I know you have some expert, at least one expert canner in here. So it's really great if you can learn how to freeze, freeze your food and can your food. And if you've got more zucchini than you can deal with, um, preserve it so that you have it in the wintertime. And that's, um, it's a really great thing to do, a really healthy thing to do. So um, that's the general uh, overview. Does anyone have questions? Yes, ma'am. In the beginning of the season, do you suggest putting down a granular um, organic fertilizer? Uh, yes, I would. Um, I would the rule of thumb is you get you get a soil test, and that'll tell you what you're missing. Um, so if you have had your soil tested and you know generally what's going on with it, um, then you know you could probably uh, follow suit. But I personally like to do a cover cropping. Uh, in the, so I've started on in my garden. I have areas that I've harvested, and now I'm putting cover crops in. And I had done it with the Head Start um, kids over here with their plots uh, one year. And that what that does is it protects the soil in the winter from the, all the elements beating down on it. Um, but then, in, then it dies. You, you want to get winter kill in this kind of garden because the one that doesn't winter kill, the roots are going to be too hard for you to manage. It's, that's good for like a big farm um, that has big machinery. But um, if you get the winter kill, then it then it dies down and it creates like a blanket. And then in the spring, you you turn that in and it feeds your soil. Um, you know, do it like two weeks before you plant. So um, I'm sorry. Did you say the name of your cover crop? Well, there's all different kinds of cover crop. Johnny's uh, Seeds has a whole um, section on cover crops, but again, make sure to get the win winter kit, something that's going to die in the frost. Because um, I think like somebody in the garden 
did like um, winter wheat or something, something like that, and the roots were so mammoth that they were practically in tears. They couldn't get it out. So yeah, it's, we put oats and English peas and yes. vetch. So now, really yeah, peas are really great because um, it puts nitrogen back into the soil. So um, the nitrogen legumes are just it's magical. Nature is magical. It takes the nitrogen out of the air and then fixes it to the roots. These little it looks like little pieces of styrofoam. Mm -hmm. um, if you dig it out and see it, so which is why you never pull your peas out. You cut them and leave the roots in because that's your fertilizer. So um, it's great to plant the peas, but you have to. The, the trick is it gets complicated because the peas you don't want to keep growing the same thing in the same spot. So if you're going to use a, a cover crop of peas, you don't want to do it where you're going to grow peas. So it's. Um, and I use, a lot of times I just use mustard seeds because that's what I have. And, um, you know, it just, it grows fast and it covers and then it's, and it's putting, um, you know, some organic matter back in. And, and that so. dies off in the winter? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I'm it does sorry, good what here kind of seed? It, 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 it does good mustard, at high pH. Mustard seeds. Oh, it does. So, yeah, brassicas do high, anything in the brassica family does good at high pH. So, um, so it works well here. So. When do you plant it? Excuse me? When do you plant the cover crop? Um, they actually give you the calendar on Johnny's, but okay. some is in July, some is in August. Yeah, so you have to, um, you know, think ahead about it. So you're it. planting it now? Yeah, I have some planted. What I did was I broadcast a lot, and then I'll transplant, because I, you know, I still have things growing in the other spots, right. so then I can transplant over there. They're already, like, seedlings. So it's too late to do it, like, in... September when you pulled everything out? No. Well, I guess what you have to think about is um, that maybe you want to do seed, seedlings, like like I'm saying, like you're going to broadcast it, or maybe you have a kind of crop, like I see a lot of space in these gardens, yeah. like in that garden right there, right. you could broadcast mustard seeds, oh. and then when you harvest that, the mustard seeds are already coming up, oh. you know, or, or the peas, you can put the peas in there. I do a group of yeah, and they're going to come up. Yeah. So, and it's um, arugula is a great crop because it's I use that as weed control. I let that I let it seed, and then um, then I have arugula all over the garden, and I don't get any weeds. And then I have arugula. So, um, and then when it's too much arugula, I just pull it out. But it's um, easy to pull out, and then I don't have the weeds. So, and I see um, over in this plot here, the head start plot, they're letting some, probably not on purpose, but that's okay, they're letting some of the lettuce go to seed. And that's actually a really great thing to do too, because the flowers are good for pollinators. And lettuce seed stays true, so it's um, whatever kind of lettuce you grew, um, that's what the seed will be. Like some, some plants are hybridized and you're, you're never going to know what you're going to get. Like with tomatoes, you might go back to, you know, if it's not an heirloom, you might get something else. Um, but the lettuce seed, you can, you don't have to buy lettuce seed. If you have a lettuce that you really like, you let it, and you did that one year with the yeah. red, she had the most beautiful red lettuce, which I egg Merlot. I Merlot, think. yes, so yes. Good. So, um, and then when you go to save the seed, you, net, you let it dry out, and then you, once it's, um, you don't want it wet, but dry it out, and then I put it in an airtight container in the refrigerator. So. Will it self-seed? You know, some things do, but some don't overtake the cold winters we have here. So I don't, I don't really know. I know the arugula self-seeds, so I don't do anything. Tomato yeah. self-seeds, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Tomato. how about mulching so with yeah. hay or it's like cut straw, clean cut straw and hay? Um, that's good. I find that um, sometimes it blows away, so you have to be careful with that. But I would, um, at the end, maybe you want to do, um, you know, we could regroup at the end of the season, because there's a whole, like, you really should be putting mulch in and, um, not mulch, compost and any amendments you need in the, in the fall, so that your, your garden is ready to go in the spring. Because the problem with doing things in the spring is it's wet, the soil's wet, and you can't work in wet soil. You compact it, this whole thing with the water and the air. You know, when, when you see big construction areas where they've got the big machines, they're compact, it becomes like cement, the, um, the soil. And the same thing when you walk in a wet garden. Your foot goes way down, you've just pressed all the air out. So it's really great to get the whole garden ready in the fall and then you're ready to go. You know, if you have the cover crop, you just turn it under and you wait um, two weeks and then you're, you know, you're good to go. Now, do you test in fall and spring? 
Um, I wouldn't do both. I mean, if I was a big farm, I probably would. I know they do that. Um, they, they test um, more than once, but I think that you want to just get a general idea of what's going on. And so, that would be fall, right, so that you can get it ready yeah, for spring? It, yeah, well, the only problem with that is is this has high pH here. And sulfur, if you were going to put an elemental sulfur down, which is the only kind I would recommend, you don't want to put aluminum sulfur or any of that. You want to put elemental sulfur down because it's gentler. Um, that needs to be put down in warm weather. Is so, it water soluble so it flushes out? or, or um, The only one I know is it's like a granular, but um, but it's it, it has to be in warm weather. It will okay. not break down. And that lowers the pH. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because I know some, in a soil class that I took, some... Amendment. I told you we had a ringer. <laughs> <laughs> the teamwork. Some amendments are water soluble, so you really have to be careful when you put them in, right? Because they'll be flushed out. Well, nitrogen is that. So okay. when you um, do your soil test, I know somebody told me they got a test kit in Home Depot that shows the nitrogen level, and I was like, okay, well, the Home Depot part, which should be your first clue that let's question <laughs> this, right? Um, nitrogen is 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 as soon as it rains, it washes it out. So, you know, we've just had three inches of rain followed by half an inch of rain, and then we had two inches of rain before that, and so you might have, you might need some nitrogen input, and, but it's hard to do on a, on a soil test. That's, you know, you really have to look at your plants and see if they, if they look like they need a little, little boost. Um, but that, that is one of those, um, there's several different things that would be hard to test and need to be added. So, um, what's a sign that they need nitrogen rather than water or? Uh, I think I would have to look at it to, 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 to show you that. I probably... What about yellowing leaves on tomatoes? That, there's a ton of, there's, I think there's like a whole chapter on tomatoes. <laughs> Problems with tomatoes um, here, but yellowing could be anything. That could be white, it could be that there's a chlorosis, which means it's, it's lacking something. Um, there could be... Um, what about yellow with spots? That could be a bunch of stuff too. That could be, um, <laughs> yeah. That's. Uh, I'm going to show you the tomato one. And, and actually, you guys can can look at your tomatoes and, and uh, look at this. But you know, here's there's all different kinds of things that happen to tomatoes. One thing that's interesting that happens to tomatoes. It's very susceptible to to, to tobacco mosaic. So no one, I hope no one here smokes, but if you do smoke, you must wash your hands before you handle tomatoes. Oh, yeah. that's so, yes, very interesting. But there's all kinds of stuff here. I, I tell you, they want to be in South America. They don't want to be here. They're making it as hard as they can, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I personally, there, it is so complicated with the tomatoes if you have a sp specific problem. I mean, I could look at it and see, yeah. but I would refer to the extension agent who are actually scientists and they could better direct you. you have to well, like in 2009, the reason that this garden came about was because 2009, we had the blight, the tomato blight. So I don't know if any of you were gardening at that time, but um, Home Depot down in South Carolina had blight and shipped off all their tomatoes to all of their stores. And um, we watched our tomatoes melt. It was, do you remember? Yeah. It was heartbreaking. Um, and that's, um, you know, there's nothing you can do. You can't add nitrogen, you can't spray something, you can't do anything, it's just gone. So that's, um, and it was, there is such a thing as a disease triangle, and this I think relates to a lot of things, but you have to have the disease, the plant, and the culture. So, um, which is good to know, it's why you should plant things exactly like they say on the packages. Don't say, well, Okay, if they say three feet, I'm going to do it every one foot because I'm going to get more vegetables. No, they're telling you three feet because it's three feet, you know, distance. But it's, when that 2009 was very cold and very rainy, which was the perfect situation for blight. So you had the disease, you had the culture, and you had the plant, the host. So if we had the disease and the plant, but we didn't have the culture, we wouldn't have had the blight. We wouldn't have lost our plants. By the culture, you mean the rain? The rain, that okay. situation. So, it, although situation could also be that you planted your plants so close uh, together that they aren't getting air, um, and that would also be a problem. So, can we go back to the soil for a second? Sure. We talk about prepping up in the fall, which mm -hmm. I do. Right. And then I'm so close to the water table right. over the winter, 
the snow packs it down. Right. So I have to put more well, that's a, that's, in the spring. That's an unusual situation. The water table here is an unusual yeah. situation. But so um, does it disturb it? I mean, do, if you know, it's going to be wet. Compost, but, but you right? have to do it. Like there's not. You don't have an option. What if so. I? What if I buy? Um, soil that's sort of drier in a bag, right? As opposed the soil, to the compost. The sitting snow here. is still going to compact it. So it's and it's and no. I mean, in the spring, oh. when I top it up. So I use the compost here, right. which I do every fall, and I put acidifier in, and I, I get some great compost from Rockefeller. Right. Or that's high Hills. though. Rock, Rockefeller right. I think is a high pH. So so we put that in. It sinks over the winter. If I buy drier compost and soil to top it up in the spring. You mean just sit it there? Yeah, and just put it on top? I, I think it's good to mix it in at that point, you know, because so you're going to be planting the directly. Soil. But, but i got to give you a warning. When you buy soil, topsoil, mm -hmm. I have not seen any topsoil lately that is topsoil. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be soil at all. It's like peat moss and uh, other stuff, and there's very little soil. So. Um, It'd be great if we had, you know, some place that we could get soil mm -hmm. that, that we know is soil. And even the pl some of the places and um, around here where you can buy it, it's it's questionable. I had a uh, the Valti is is not topsoil. I know it's mixed with sphagnum or, or yeah, some peat. kind of peat. Right. But it's they're very light, you know, and uh -huh. that's your clue that there's yeah. like that's not it's topsoil. Mm. These bags are it's easy mm. to pick up, mm. and um, um, there's one company that I really love and. They, um, I went to pick up the bag this year, or was it last year, and it was like, whoa, what happened? Mm -hmm. And the, the proprietor of the store said that um, they had gotten a lot of complaints that it was too heavy to pick up the bag. <laughs> well, uh, so they put more peat in it? There's some peat in it. I was not happy. Send the people to the gym. <laughs> Come on. Do you make any recommendations for good topsoils? Um, you know, I... I gotta say, one of our gardeners here, I actually gave her a bucket of my soil from my yard. So I don't know, it'd be great if there was, um, I know there's, you know, places people are building and things like that. I don't know if, you know, it'd be great if you could just get the native soil. is so fantastic here. Um, it'd be great if, I, I don't know what else to say. But I would say, you know, just research. Like when you question what the soil is and because if it's, um, you know, you want those minerals and everything that's gonna be in a mineral soil. You know, compost is decomposed leaves. It's like gas. It's basically, it's, it's gas. It's, it's a decomposing um, organic matter. It's not soil. You can't grow in it. Just compost. You well, you know, people do, um, but it's. I think that that has a short life. I think that. Um, but you know, people do hydroponics. There's all different kinds of ways to grow. Um, and that's there's a lot of science in hydroponics. Straw bales. Now. Yeah, there's a lot. But I think um, my fa father was raised on a farm. I believe in soil. <laughs> yeah. Do you think now, since since you're saying that you know it's hard to find topsoil, um, the peat and everything is. I mean, we have this same right. feeling that it's not sustainable. Therefore, we try to find. There's an argument with that because I did. The, I was. I've right. been talking to people, and they're saying there are sustainable ways. I don't. Uh, the Canadians sources. say that they're sustainable. Yeah. So I don't. So many millions of acres of it. Right. But my question is actually another one, which is. Since so much topsoil seems to be mixed more with peat or some sort of, uh, right. you know, matter that's going to create air and stuff, how about adding green sand? You know, I'd have to look that up. I don't mineral. know. Yeah, I don't know. The problem with the um, with the soil that's adding the peat. So you're thinking, oh, peat is like 3.5 pH. That would be excellent for these very um, alkaline soil that we have here. But the problem is when you get it in a bag, they have adjusted it so it's a perfect pH at seven. They're doing something to it to make it so that it's, you know, because most people, you know, everybody, most everybody in, in, in Westchester has acidic soils. So they're not going to want to add a really acidic product. But, um, and also uh, when you get things that have manure in it, they use lime to um, offset the smell. So, and, and it lifts, lifts the, uh, the pH. So. You have to research when you're buying something. You have to research. It'd be, um, it'd be you know, you're, you're making your own compost here. That's great, and the town provides the um, leaf compost, which is fantastic. Um, those kind of things, like you have more control over what you're putting in your garden. You know, because um, they don't use any pesticides in the parks. 
so, um, so you know you're not getting any chemicals. You know, stuff that leaves that get put on the street that might have, you know, somebody might be using the chemicals. You don't know. But, um, so I guess I'm not really answering your question, but except that I would just, when you go to buy something, just see what's in it. And they don't ever, they usually don't list the pH, but you call the company and they'll call you. And I, that's why I know lobster compost is seven. They, they told me that, you know, so it's, um, that's... Did you perfect. check on the other one they make, Coast of Maine? They make a blueberry, yeah, mussel, salmon... Yeah, I would like almost... see <laughs> out. You should call and find yeah, out, and I'll then let me know. Okay. But I, I would bet that it's not going to be very acidic just because they're selling the product to a general audience, yeah. and so they're going to adjust, you know. So that's, that's it. I'll check that out. So. And how about the coconut? Wow, how are you well, that I am not familiar with the product, but you have brought it up, so I looked it up, and that's 5.2 pH, which actually would be really great. It's a substitute for peat moss. Um, so, of course, you know, we're worried about the sustainability of peat moss, which is why um, I tend to not use peat moss, but, um, but I am being told that there are sustainable practices in Canada, so if you're getting it um, from those sources, it's a better choice, and that's 3.5, which would definitely help um, your garden. Um, you know, the coconut is, you know, they're not raising coconuts here, so there's a footprint on that too, you know. Um, not that I know of, I haven't seen any coconut trees. <laughs> you haven't? <laughs> wait for, wait for but I haven't been to every property, <laughs> I haven't been to every property, I don't want to make a generalization there. But in, you know, in the bigger picture, it does, it, you know, you are using something, you know, you are recycling something when you're using that, that product, and it's, um, and it would be acidic, so it, you know, it sounds like it would be good, but I can't really endorse it because I haven't used it. But I, you know, I think it's worth investigating for sure. Is there any other? So you would say coffee grounds would be a good thing in this soil? You know, they say um, that, cause I don't know if you use coffee grounds in the compost? No, no. we do at home. Yeah. Um, they say that by the time you've made the coffee, like pretty much all the acidity has gone out of the grinds, so it's not really that acidic. Um, and compost too, like you can put a lot of acidic things in there, but once it breaks down, it's not gonna be, you know, that big of a shift. Um, but, you know, the, the more things you have in your compost, um, the, better, the better it's gonna be, because it's gonna have different things in it, you know, so. Um, it's something to consider, like especially, I know, like, the uh, Good Choice, uh, that's the name of the restaurant down in Austin, they, if you go there, they'll give you um, their vegetable stuff, you know, and that's, um, they're all organic there, the food's great, by the way, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the village of Austin, um, but uh, they will give you, bring a bucket and they'll give you stuff, and that, um, that'd be really, you know, something to consider to add to the compost here. As long as it's organic, that's definitely organic. So, um, any, any other questions? Yes. I want to you show you something, but I'm not going to do it later. Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll do it later. Yeah, I think you're going to have to send yours to the science. No, it's not. Yeah. Tomatoes are gorgeous. No problem. Lots of them. But the plants are dying. Yeah. Well, it's probably, have you had your soil tested? I'm going to advise you to get well, your soil tested. Well, it was done a couple of years ago. Yeah, I would uh, I would advise you to get the soil tested and then talk to, uh, take one of these cards and talk yeah, to will. them. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Because... It's uh, killing me because yeah. I don't understand it. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. tomatoes are, there's a lot of different things with tomatoes. And um, a lot of it is with culture, you know, that there's um, there's something that it's not getting. Um, so that's uh, well, I, fixable. Well, I'll show you what, I, what they recommended that I use okay. organic. See, the thing is with, um, you have a fertilizer there. You don't know what is missing in your soil. No, and I, it seemed yeah. like a good mixture, but, but I don't know what I'm missing. Right, Right. so the yeah. only way you can know that is with a soil test. Because now you're just throwing stuff I'm at it. throwing so it at it, and I don't know. Yeah, because like work. say if you I have a lot of potassium or magnesium in your soil, and you so add it, yeah. it's just going to flush away, and you're right next to a pond. You know, it's like, it's really something to consider, just generally. Like, you know, I see people in my neighborhood routinely, you know, on, on schedule doing the fertilizing, doing the liming, and I'm pretty sure none of them are testing the soil. And we're, you know, we have, we're rich in waterways here, so it's, it's not a wise thing to do. It's something, um, and I know that, you know, companies 
are charging based on doing these services. But I personally, if I had that company, I would just pay them anyway and tell them not to do it, um, rather than um, you know just waste a product. So that's all I have to say. It's not a bad product at all. But it's um, if you're having a problem, the fertilizer is probably not going to fix it. Me this, and this is a different product. And this one is acidifier. Copper. It, it's copper sulfate. Well, that um, might not be organic. I he said it was, but I don't know. Yeah, I think I know. Mm. That you have to be really careful. You should say organic. I used right very on little it. of this last year. Yeah. Okay. Well, that we can talk about that later because that's um, to work with. So I don't know. Just yeah. a question. Copper is a heavy metal. About yeah. the soil testing. Yeah. Yeah. I've had mine done a few yes, times I know. over the years. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've always done it in the spring. Right. So you're saying you can do it now in the. Yeah. So what would be interesting yeah. um, and okay. is that. When you're doing it in the spring, it's before you've planted, and right. the plants have taken all those nutrients out. Uh -huh. You know, so in the fall, you'll see, you know, what's taken out. So mm -hmm. the the spring is interesting because you know, like, what you're starting with. Right. You know, so. Um, but it you know. makes sense to do it again and to do it in the fall. In yeah. Spring. Except the yeah. thing is, is that it comes to a, a cost. Like you have yeah. little plots yeah. here. You're, you know, you're spending money on plants. You're spending money on things. And like, how much do you want to spend for that tomato? You know, it's like, so, um, you know, I think if, if you're doing it once a year or every once every two years, you're yeah. having a gauge of what's yeah. going on. And then, you know, the rule of thumb is whatever you take out of the garden, you got to put back in, out of the soil. So if you're harvesting a lot of tomatoes mm. and a lot of cucumbers and whatever else, you know, you've, they've all just that's all those <coughs> nutrients out of the soil. That's what's in those plants. So now you need to put those nutrients back. And the compost is the best way to do that. So when you... Um, but you know, realistically, we have wonderful compost, but there's a lot of people. Right. It's not like we get it's not enough. tons to put right. into our garden. Right. Yeah. Well, I've just found a new compost that I um, really... It was highly recommended to me by a really expert farmer. And um, it's Hemlock Hills. Uh, which is in, on in Portland, on yeah. uh, Portland Avenue. And I just bought two bags. Yeah. Did you yeah. buy it from them? Yeah. Yes. Oh. You buy it's, it's very, very heavy bags, so yeah. they can put it in really the car full. for you, but you make sure you have somebody to take it out of the car for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's full. It's full. Yeah. It's $16 but it's very good. a bag. But it is not a low pH. It is, um, I think it's about 6.8. I, I tested it roughly, so it's, um, but, so it's not going to, you know, it's not going to lower your pH like you want to do, but it's going to put all your, they're working with Cornell, to, to make this product, so um, it's got a, it's a very rich um, with a lot of diverse um, nutrients in it. So I would it's a mixture of manures and chicken cow, yeah. but and they do put lime sheep. because of the manures. Yeah, right? so it's just generally what they put plants so. as well. And so it's raised, it, which is it'd be better for us if it wasn't raised, but then you might not be able to handle the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> So. And what about chicken poo straight up? Were you able to do any no, more? No, I did not look at that. Um, I would prefer not to buy the product that's been shipped if there's a way to get something that's local and support the local farmers. Um, and we do have local farmers here making products. So yeah. um, so nothing against the um, package stuff, but um, it would be really great to support those. People but are you have doing to great practice, it, right? You have to season it. Not yeah. the hemlock hills. That's right at the back. No, but if you were to get chicken poop from a farmer, oh, you can yes, or you get it, <laughs> you can compost it. <laughs> you get it composted. They would, they would, oh, they, they would, would know they would it was have composted. composted. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or if it's not composted, then yes, you have to season it. And I'm not sure where you're going to put that in the garden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that would be that would be very good. And then you know you know exactly how they're taking care of those yeah. animals. You know yeah. you know exactly what you're getting. So and and it's we live in a great uh, a really interesting area that we have all these um, you know farms and people doing very sustainable things. Um, so it'd be nice to support all of those. So. Any other questions? Good to go. Yo. Oh yeah, I wanted to ask about uh, like greens. You have been talking a lot more about fruit type. Uh huh. Right? And what about greens? Is there anything different? With whether it's kale or tart uh, or Well, any of the brassicas, which would be kale, is in that family, uh, will take a higher pH. It's got a bigger range, um, so that'll that'll do well. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, when I say tomatoes and cucumbers, I'm meaning everything. Like, you need all of those nutrients that, you know, for the carrot, I know with Stone Barns, they did, they tested their carrot um, because they, I mean, they have this amazing soil. They've been working on it for a long time and really 
paying attention. They test it frequently, um, and it this there was like there's like a sweetness scale or something, and the carrots were unbelievable, like like so sweet. But it was because of all of those you know, nutrients that were going into making that carrot, you know, so when you get, you know, when you get a carrot that's, um, you know, just in a bag and it's not organic, it's, it doesn't taste the same as, as those, you know, you go to the farmer's market and you get those, like, gorgeous carrots, it's, it's, the taste is different, so. I've noticed that with the change in temperature, because when it gets cold, mm. well, they, several they, vegetables are they cold. Are more related. sugar. Brussels sprouts need need yeah. a freeze to get a good yeah. flavor. Um, yeah, the carrots get very woody when it gets hot, or they actually can change color um, because if it's too hot. Um, so, yeah. So it's nature's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, congratulations to all of you for being community gardeners. I assume everyone here has a plot, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. congratulations to you for being a master gardener. Yes. Oh. Yeah. And for starting <laughs> the garden. Yes. Yeah. Making, yeah. It, making oh. it possible yeah. for us. Making it possible with, you. For us. with the help of um, Sue Donnelly and others. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.